Hello there everyone and thank you for joining me here in the new campaign in Hearts of Iron 4 using the mod Extremis Ultimus Demo, the death of democracy, which right now we're playing as the good old America led by some sort of a Tulsi Gabbard. Totally never heard of about her before, but this is a demo for the mod in which America is going to go explode. But if you want to read about all these details, please go right ahead. We've got the 50s and 60s. Oh my god. Um, is that the days of rage? The Reagan years. First part. And then, of course, the rest of this. And then the Reagan years, part two. The Rumfeld years. Interesting. Donald Donald, huh? And then, there we go. And then we have the Bush years. Oh, God. Oh, Bush is all the way up here. All right, there's that. And then followed up with this. Uh, and the Clinton years. Eight years of the Clinton. Also, we have 9-11. Good old 9-11. Planes go boom. The War on Terror. Oh, hello. Uh, but also, I will be reading, because this is my first time in this, uh, playing this mod, the 08 Collapse, that's pretty normal, um, I will be reading pretty much all the events just to see what it's like, and kind of go from there. And we blame Duck Parade. So. Okay, and then with the Sanders administration. Okay, interesting. Alright. And there we go. So there's all that stuff. We're going to continue. Oh god, what the heck? Contro setting the stage. Extreme polarization of American politics. I mean, select cards from the left to learn more about histories. The anarchist perspective for liberty. The James Haddock perspective. Interesting. Uh, and then we have the president's perspective. I guess President Sanders died in mid-2022, huh? God, I can't believe it's already passed. It's already 2023 at the time of this recording. The communist perspective and the rightist perspective. For the nation. So here we go. We have executive measures. Oh, wait. Oh, we could have been weathering the storm. Oh. Uh. Well, you know what? Instead of this one, let's go with weathering the storm. That seems like the most, the more neutral one. Congress once again found itself in a deadlock that is actively preventing anything from getting through to President Gabbard's desk. God dang, Congress. We have foreign competition in the domestic market. Pretty normal. Oh, the Secretary of Homeland Security. Since the late President uh, Sanders' inauguration today, the cabinet post for Secretary of Homeland Security has stood vacant as a senator. Sanders was vehemently opposed to the passage of the Homeland Security Act in 2002, which created the department and uh, the post of secretary, and he carried that conviction with him to his grave. With his death, however, President Gabbard sought to nominate a candidate for the position, and the fractious Republican majority in the Senate has begrudgingly confirmed her first choice, Nina Jankowicz, an obscure political operative who was involved in the 2020 Democratic campaign. It remains to be seen what the new secretary will bring into the cabinet room. Another of Bernie's plans abandoned. Oh. Um, we have police and citizens clash. Not good. We've got members of 08. I, we still have members of those. Fading Empire. Oh, that feels really bad. Uh, military overextension. That feels really bad as well. Jesus. The Sinuji bombing. Oh. Bombing the North Korean city of Sinuji. Okay. The discouraged generation. Are you talking about me again? Yeah. The young have no such memories. Uh, the earliest memories are of terrorist attacks, prepared drills, and bloodstained threats, sands, and flags. Okay. Uh, political collapse. Oh, that's destroying our weekly stability. Okay. Crumbling infrastructure. The Second Amendment. Okay, I feel good about that. And then we have Five Eyes Program. Oh, God. Last companies capitulated. Oh, okay, whatever. Um, and then we'll do what else? The deadlock. After looking over our options, the best bet for not harming. Uh, Gabbard's uh, reputation further simply bide her time wait for the stalemate to fight on its own. After all, Congress faced and gotten out of several gridlocks before. So, we're on the brink of collapse here. So we have three options. The Republican Union of America, the Lion Rebellion, and the Confederation of America eventually. Also, if you want to check out the mod for yourself, um, uh, you can check it out in the first link in the description below. Another month, another shooting. A local motorist, Yancey Williams, was killed in an altercation with police today when he stepped out of his car to routine traffic stop in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and sparked outrage across the state. The official statement from the MPD is that the officer involved in the shooting, one William Richard, the place on paid administrative leave, placed under investigation. Protesters are already calling for Richard to be tried for murder in the first degree, taken to the streets right tonight in mass. Let's go. And over this one, we don't care about Argentina. The lame duck. Oh, most your tactics. At first, just a few families, veterans, and local militias trying to defend their businesses and property from looting. Soon enough, though, the real heavy hitters came into the scene, ready to bring down the boot on anarchists and looters. The Proud Boys and Oath Keepers, and even some militia of Montana made it across the Dakotas, all showed up. Much of military surplus, faces covered by massive American flag. Whoever the anarchists gathered on Black Block, 
The militias answered in kind, aggressive and energetic, deputizing themselves, ready to lay down the law where the police couldn't or wouldn't. We both to keep. And the lame duck. Sometimes doing best tends to uh, make you lose a little influence over the people around you. Eh, that's okay, because despite all this dissatisfaction surrounding your administration, they can't blame the person at the top because of recurrent problems or caused by it, right? Iron cops arrive. Or Iron Corps arrives. The Corps shows up. Don't try to meet. Great. Where are they headed? Model Lab says, don't know. Let me check. They're on Hennepin in South Washington by the bridge. Yeah, they are. Fantastic. Heard that Minnesota League got gas with riders. Had to pull back. They should shore up our north flank. Yeah, where are your boys going to, going to be? We're downtown. Uh, Lowry Hill and Stephen Square. All right, we're two stomps more. Uh, going to stomp some goons up north with the Corps then. Solidarity and that stuff. Finally, some backup. Oh, we're down here too. Oh. All right, the police are on us. F, 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 ESP guys are on us. Seems like I see, but they're not acting like them. Cops, too. What do you mean? Where are you now? In the warehouse district. Got pushed back. Kicking our butts here. We're going to try and pull out. We're, sa what's, we're safe. Don't, uh, crap, there couldn't be any cops. Riders Northwest and Hawthorne. Try to head that way. And don't attack the cops. We don't let them take you either. Guys, what the heck? Oh, look at this. People's Republic. People's Republic of Ukraine. Oh, look at this guy. Oh, look at this guy. Gossettos. Uh The marches and riots in Minneapolis have ended today after Minneapolis police, aided by the federal FBI, restored order of the city. Almost 100 arrests have been made with several high-profile arrests of local activist leaders have seemingly calmed down the situation, bringing peace to Minneapolis once more. Up next is a consultant with the MPD, one Antonin Fonseca, here to tell us what really happened. This animals got what was coming to them. Oh, I chose a far-right perspective? Oh. Executive measures? Oh, was I supposed to overwrite? Oh, who, we are... Tulsi Gabbard, and we're social liberals. Oh. Or are we supposed to go this way? Oh, crud. Well, maybe we'll go this way. Executive measures. The consequence of the growing amount of political entities and polarization is the inability of the legislative branch to enact any proper policy makings. Luckily, the Office of the President has a few tricks that can be utilized to push forward on the reforms needed, risky maneuvering. The legislative process has always been shifting the web of alliances and backroom deals. We need to maneuver away through the system we want to get things done. Friends of Congress. While the Democrats only play a small role in both houses, there are still other moderate parties we can align with to gather some support behind us. In addition to that, we can offer some incentives to get a few more friends and use the memory of Bernie. Although he's long gone by this point, Bernie Sanders still holds a place in many congressional hearts. We can use this to help pass some legislation by implying it's what he would have wanted. Campaign preparations. Union 571 hadn't been a thing since 2015 when the new Haven Haversbrook steel plant shut down for good. As members had dispersed, taking on menial retail, living off small pensions they had. For many, those pensions were the only thing that kept them alive. And the man who got them was now standing on a stage in front of the shuttered steel plant. And the un banner of Union 571 was waving alongside the American flag. What? When the 1% stole your jobs, ripped out the heart of this town, who stood up for New, New Haversbrook, roared James Haddock to his audience. James did, yelled the people of New Haversbrook. They hadn't forgotten what Haddock had done for them, and how he spent sent those corporate lawyers scrambling, how he saved them, if only just barely. When they tried to take away your pensions and leave you penniless, all for the years you have toiled, who defended you? James did. Haddock beamed a warm smile to the audience, New Haversbrook. You were the first safer case I took, and yet I got, though I got those lucky dudes to pay for what they owed, it was not nearly enough. My fellow Americans, I was only able, able to get you scraps. Look around. Has anyone paid for the devastation? For the opioid deaths and the misery of the paycheck to paycheck living? No, screamed the crowd. Fists were shaken. Feats were stamped. Flexes, spittle, flew as the men and women of New Haven's broke recalled what things used to be like and, the, and what they should be like. My fellow Americans, do you want to keep living off scraps, or do you want the whole darn turkey? Do you want any settlements, or do you want justice? Yes, came the roar, the roar of desperate people who had just found their messiah. Haddock smiled again, he sized up the audience. They were like hungry dogs who just passed a steak waved in front of their faces. Time to deliver. We have a new Haber's Brook who's going to be your next president. James Wall came the thunderous call. Uh, behind Haddock's uh, podium, a massive banner was unfurled. It was black with a geonomic, a geometric red and white blocks. On it was printed the phrase, James Haddock 2024. So now, like we just read, uh, another month on the shooting, we're just going to finish up uh, executive measures. Victory for these guys, who cares? Price mobilizes guard. We need much. We need muscle, but what worth is muscle if it's too afraid to go to club? Erasmus, the previous leader of the Iron Corps, was unwilling to live up to the requirements of the modern leader. The Corps' embarrassment to the hands of the anarchists and other militants was truly embarrassing to watch, and it was all due to softness, his inability to, for lack of a better term, crack skulls. We had to reform a pair of military arm, and this Dallas Price might just be the man to lead it. We'll keep our connections to Price and militants a secret, still referring to them publicly as Iron Corps. In secret, though, uh, they will be the government urgent administrative response detail or guard. Whatever Price needs to assist the party, we shall acquire, but we need to make, keep a respectable uh, public distance from their activities. What better turning ground for such a group of willing men than those rides in Minneapolis? First engagements begin. The God arrives. 
Uh, they arrived the night of yore, striding out of the battlefield without fear or hesitation. Minneapolis bleeding and the guard was abandoned, determined to stop the flow. They quell this rebellion no matter what, crushing anarchists and riotists alike. All divisionists must fall for America to rise again. This is what Haddock was preaching privately. In reality, the guard was little more than another paramilitary group, coming to chew on the bones of a city engulfed by chaos. The police guard, uh, or police, initially worried about the entry of a new paramilitary group, soon grew to begrudgingly admire the guard. Even sending up lines of communication to direct them whenever they needed them the most. They were brawlers and thugs, sure, but they were brawlers and thugs that were on the side of order. And the police, that's really all that mattered. Lay down the law, and then, side of order. It's about more than intimidation. It's about sending a message. We're not pro-left or pro-right, we're pro-order, and we'll do whatever it takes to save our nation. Erasmus was soft and afraid to engage. Counting on the sheer power of numbers to paint a picture of strength, Price is strong and willing, counting on the clenched fists. And since by the strange charisma and warrior spirit of Mr. Price, our men descended upon flocks of anarchists as well as the rightists, turning their own mob tactics against them, driving them away from buildings and tying their hands so law enforcement could get themselves together. If no one else will step up to keep order, we will. We won't repeat Erasmus' mistakes. Dust settles. As long as he goes bye-bye. Well, we can do this one, I guess. First. But well, it's going to take a little bit of time here. I don't like how small these are compared to everything else. We're trying to build a lot, but we have, like, no resources. This is militants. The riots in Minneapolis were a microcosm uh, for our, the broader political fires from brewing in America. With puns from every radical branch imaginable showing up to have a crack at one another soon, however, some had to come back to the riots as if yet. The absence of prominent radicals from their YouTube channels, blogs, and other social media outlets is strike, and some begin to uh, suspect foul play on the part of the government. Um, who else, after all, could so effectively disappear many people? Strange, but not a problem. The communists try over it. Uh, for immediate use, San Francisco, California, today in fear of and a feat of solidarity. Not seen since the Third International. The proletarian parties of the PLS PLSL, CPUSA, and the RPPP, RBPP have announced the formation of Electoral College, or Coalition. After a lengthy discussions at an unknown location, the three parties agreed that the time for the destruction of the neoliberal capitalist system was at hand. We best achieved through the use of their own failed electoral systems. Part now under the name of CPUSA PL, PSL is yet to nominate a leader, however. Anonymous insiders revealed to us an exclusive scoop that Gloria La Riva, a prominent member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation, has appeared at the forefront. Uh, runner. Beating out as anonymous chairman of the CPUSA and the RP, RBPP, along with other PSL hopefuls like Michael Prisoner, Eugene Purier, and PSL founder Brian Becker. While his news remains unconfirmed by the newly created coalition, we expect them to make an announcement confirming this within the week, as long as they don't challenge us. Price is a bright idea. If you want to buy this, please go ahead. Uh, with anarchists in the streets counting on the downfall of the police system and the state as a whole, we'd be astonished to find a police station that hasn't become at least a little polarized as of late. With the radical new ideas becoming more and more acceptable, we might be able to find a few friends in the police stations of the Northwest, perhaps. In a year or so, we could even have them at our up and call. See how it goes. Um, sure. Why not? It's only everything's falling apart. Heavy inflation, huh? Quickly change minus 2%, huh? Candy see for Christmas, huh? Ah, oh, San Francisco. Today, speaking to a crowd assembled outside the party headquarters in San Fran, Gloria La Riva announced her candidacy for the presidency. At last, the founding member of the PSL, addressing the roaring crowd, announced another downtrodden of America of a new champion. She addressed the death and legacy of President Sanders, praising him for his lifelong efforts to assist those who, quote, have been forgotten by the neoliberal capitalist system. La Riva, at times having to pause let the roars of the crowd diminish, continue explaining her plans to bring peace and prosperity to the divided nation. Arching a new era for America, an era where no one would be left behind. She finished her speech by speaking to the crowd. A leader of the crowd in a rousing chorus of international, before urging her followers not to interact with the growing number of San Francisco PD parked outside the roped-off area. She was quickly ushered off stage as the police began to heckle her into the safety of the PSL headquarters. Well, no, they wouldn't be able to resist. Comes control. With the power of the best means, present by the Constitution and laws of the United States of America, I hereby order as follows: Section one, Communist Party prohibitions pursuant to the Communist Control Act of 1954. Parties adhering to the anti-democratic ideals of communism are hereby barred from participating in any state or federal elections. The affected parties are here uh, attached hereto as the Communist Party of the United States of America, the Party for Social Socialism and Liberation, and the Eagle Spear Party. And the Eagle Spear Party? Anger of a gentleman. They did what? Had a grod as his voice is cold as polarized. He stood up slowly before throwing a newspaper he'd been reading down onto his desk. Um, barely missing the pap and hot cup of coffee, set carefully on a custer. They had to deliver the paper wins. So it was not often had a glass of temper, but when he did, it was truly something to behold. 
The aide almost jumped when he heard the door open behind him, only relaxed when he felt the hand of Price resting upon his shoulder. You can go, Price whispered to him, patting his shoulder twice in a reassuring manner. The aide wasted no time quickly scurrying out of the room, closing the door behind him as he did so. Haddock barely noticed Stupo busy pa pacing back and forth in his office. They think they'd sink so low so openly. Haddock spoke unconstitutional. That's what it is. His eyes suddenly lit up, the passion that had drawn Price and so many others back or sur in. Unconstitutional, unconstitutional, Haddock repeated, almost mantra-like as he walked over the personal law library. Running over his finger along the various books till he found the one he was looking for. Price, gather my collection. We're going to give the uh, uh, female dog a lesson on the law. He's on the warpath now. Off the ballot. The initial shock of events. The president has activated the Communist Control Act of 54, saying that this is America. Dangerous forces cannot be allowed to subvert our democracy. Cooper, how many states have followed through with the legislation? Looks like 18 so far have struck the party for socialism and liberation. The Communist Party USA and the Eagle Spirit Party from the ballots, including swing states such as Texas and Florida, as well as Democratic bastions such as Illinois and California. So what does it mean for the election, Cooper? Coming live from New York City, we have Enrique Valdez, a legal scholar to explain. And from Anderson Cooper and Andy Cohen, CNN. We'll say this right. People still watch CNN? Huh. People still watch TV? PRC. Russia. Doing Russian things. James Haddock versus U.S. James Haddock, a seasoned lawyer and political leader, has filed a suit in federal court against the Justice Department over Executive Order 14062, known as Executive Order 231. This order is signed by presidential candidate Tulsi Gabbard, prohibits communists from participating in the state elections. Haddock argues that the order violates the First Amendment rights of the Eagle Spear Party, which he is a leader. He claims the party is not and has never been a communist organization, therefore cannot be subjected to the restrictions outlined in EO 231. The Supreme Court has agreed to hear the case, so using its original jurisdiction to quickly resolve the issue and rule on the constitutionality of EO 231, the court hopes to do so before too much damage to democratic legitimacy is caused by the order. The case has garnered significant attention from the media and political circles, as it has the potential to significantly impact the upcoming state elections. It remains to be seen how the Supreme Court will rule on the contentious issue. We'll have our day in court. Uh, there you go. They have execution. The New York State Attorney General makes statement on Eagle Spear Party's ballot status. The New York State Attorney General has released a statement regarding the Eagle Spear Party's ballot status in the upcoming state elections. In light of the ongoing illegal battle over the Executive Order 14062, which seeks to prohibit communists from participating in state elections, the Attorney General stated that ESP will not be struck from the ballot in New York until the legal situation is clear. The Attorney General went on to implore the Supreme Court to deliver a preliminary injunction one way or the other so the states can know how to proceed without, with regard to the ballot. The court is currently considering the case of James Haddock v. United States. In which the Eagle Spear Party argues that Executive Order 14062 violates First Amendment rights. Statement from New York State's Attorney General is being seen as a win for the Eagle Spear, uh, Eagle Spear Party, as laws remain on the ballot while the legal battle plays out. It remains to be seen how this decision will impact the broader political landscape in the upcoming Supreme Court decision. Violence with, with some sense. Friends of Congress. Guiltless manipulation. With these new tactics to employ, we'll have the ability to steer most representatives into a political wing. Hopefully this will last. But it ain't no guarantee. Who's Raphael? Amber Company, New Republicans. Who are New Republicans? And National Resistance Party. State of the Union Address. Now legislative matters have been taken care of. It's time to cap it off with an annual address in February, I guess. Death of Tsing Ying Wang. Well, we know with that, please go ahead. What a horrible way to die. I got a couple nukes. Anger in the ranks. Captain Price has been staring at his phone reading the messages and reports coming from his comrades. He's been receiving reports about his men from the frustration with the current legal battle over Executive Order 14062. He knew they had to do something to placate his men or risk losing their interests. He considered his options for a moment, then made his decision. He allowed the guard to blow off some steam. He knew that this was a risky move, but he believed that it was necessary to keep his men in line. He issued the orders and watched his men prepare for their mission. As he watched them go, he couldn't help but feel a sense of pride and power and strength of the guard. They are the protectors of the Eagle Spirit Party, and they would do whatever it took to defend their cause. I'm sure we can find a way for them to blow off steam, right? Who do we have here? Nina Jankowicz. The Guards' Confrontation. The Eagle Spirit's Party. Oh. Oh, if you don't know about this one, please go ahead, too. Um, but paramilitary unit defends against communist aggression. In a bold and necessary move, units of the Iron Corps, the paramilitary arm of the Eagle Spirit Party, defended against communist aggression at the protests in New York. The communists who've been causing trouble for the ESP through their involvement in the ongoing legal battle over EO 14062 were finally met with resistance. Eyewitnesses report that the Iron Corps units were heavily armed and seemed to be targeting the communists specifically. While the mainstream media is trying to portray this as a random act of violence, the truth is that the communists have been causing problems for the ESP for far too long. It's only a matter of time before the Iron Corps took on action to defend the ESP and its leader, James Haddock. I need a word with you, command commanda Commandant. Commandant. And Commandant's admonition. 
Look, Jan's boy's getting restless. I need someone to go, someone to go after. Commandant Price had its tone for his Price's words in his mouth. Regardless of how the lower ranks feel, we cannot afford to draw more attention to ourselves with such brazenness. Uh, shift, uh, Price shifted it from foot to foot, avoiding Haddock's eyes. Sir, you know, Price, I know what I'm doing. If people start looking into the Iron Corps, they're going to find threads. We'll follow those threads, and then those threads will lead right back to you, me, and the ESP. We have an election to win, and being openly associated with the street violence is not going to win it. Price slowly nodded. Understood, sir, he said with a note of annoyance that Haddock failed to catch. Then the command commandant exited Haddock's office, letting James get back to his case. Notes. Self control now, uh, self negation later. Do we get it? Nope. Hey, goodbye. Here are the dragon's pond, so there you go. Cool. Happy Lunar New Year. Nice. Who does he have? Joe Kennedy the third. Pete Buddha Judge. Matt Duss. And Andrew Yang. Wow, he's still is he still relevant? Overhaul in the military? Uh, blow and compensating to stupidity. The military now needs uh, an overhaul now more than ever. It's not a fun push through the Pentagon audit. Economic revival, huh? Miracle will stand strong. Currently, the political situation has not been great, but no matter, we shall try through this and come out on top. Economic revival. Never truly recover from the 08 crash, no matter how you spin it, and it's up to me to set it straight. Well, we'll try. To national totalitarianism. Change heart in Tennessee. Uh, officials in Tennessee have joined New York by preliminary restoring the uh, Spirit Party to ballot and for the upcoming presidential race or election, pending a verdict or junction, injunction in James Haddock v. United States. Very good. Oh. Who do so you. Oh. Uh, I don't know. We might get copyright struck, so. War in Europe once again. Oh boy. What happened to Belarus? Um, there you go. Can we send them stuff? No. Good luck, guys. Oh, it seems like they're mostly holding. Oh. Hate the rich. Fiscal conservatism. Cut back on spending. Well. Okay. They're slowly winning against them, but not by very much. This is a very slow win. Huh. Oh, actually, Ukraine pushed up. Conspiracy theories? Oh, look at that. You read about this? Please go to heaven? Oh. Oh, yeah. Presidential candidate James Haddock is a new potential leader of the Club of Rome? Huh. That'd be something, wouldn't it? And then, do you have, what buffs do you have? Yellow Revolution. Uh, Hrushitsky's Dream. Constitution of Bilingualism. Uncompensated Corruption. Special Regime. Great Brain Drain. Long Night. Fading Memories. There you go. Sure. Oh, they're starting to crumble a little bit here. Logistics issue? Uh, cut the fat. After a review, we found so much waste within our military. Exosuit program? Gone. Luxury's gone. Anything not bought of the performance must be cut. Stabilizing the country. Riders become a regular occurrence within the last few years, but these are ways to mitigate there are ways to mitigate the damage caused that we can utilize. Nina's suggestions. With current methods being deemed insufficient, Nina's a couple ideas on how to uh, better control the situation in the streets. Light of the oligarchs, so there you go. From on high. The Supreme Court has begun to hand down decisions on the cases. On the docket for this term is experience expected. The highly anticipated. Uh, result of James Haddock v. United States will be released in the next few days, and the country's a buzz with interest to release a buzz with interest, as can be expected, for a case with the most foregone, foregone conclusion. The only unknown details of which are relatively dry p points regarding the constitutionality of certain provisions of a 70-year-old law. Time for this very farce to end. 
Had it. Thank you for seeing me, Chief Justice Roberts. I know you're busy, but this case is very important to me and my party. Roberts says, of course, James, I remember you well from your time as a clerk here. I always thought you had a bright future ahead of you. Now, what can I do for you? I want to discuss the case I filed against the Justice Department over Executive Order 14062. I believe that it violates the First Amendment rights of my party, and I was hoping to get a sense on how you and the rest of the court might rule. Roberts, I understand your concern, James, but I'm afraid I can't discuss the specifics of a pending case with you. I can assure you, however. The courts will give your case the careful consideration it deserves, and rule based on the law and the Constitution, so if I were you, I'd not worry. I understand, Chief Justice. I want to make sure that my voice was heard. Thank you for your time, and it always puts a smile on my face. Good news then, huh? Banned. Verdict. In a major victory for James Haddock and the Eagle Spirits Party, the Supreme Court has handed down a near unanimous verdict in the case of James Haddock v. United States. The court ruled that the Communist Control Act cannot apply to the Eagle Spirits Party as it does not meet any reasonable definition of a communist action organization. Additionally, the court found the Executive Order 14062, also known as EO231, is broadly unconstitutional. The court ruled that the Communist Control Act cannot be used to strike parties from the ballot, and the ban on radio and television appearances is a textbook example of prior restraint violating the First Amendment with no clear and present danger. This ruling is a major blow to presidential candidate, Tulsi Gabbard, who signed the act or order as an attempt to fight back against the rising tide of radicalism. It remains to be seen how this ruling will impact the upcoming election in the broader political landscape. The Eagle Spirit Party has released a statement praising the court's decision and thanking their legal team for the hard work in this case. James Haddock, the party's leader, has vowed to continue fighting for the rights and the rights of all Americans. The outcome was never really in doubt. Unconstitutional orders. Oh, okay. Well, Pooh's been assassinated. There you go. That was... Faster than what's going to happen in real life, I guess. I don't know. New and old. Ever since President Trump failed to keep the party together after 2020, the Republican Party has been split between two rivalry parties, the new Republican Party and the old Republican Party. The old Republican Party, made of more traditional conservative politicians, have voted Florida Governor Ron DeSantis to run for president. DeSantis, seen as the evolution of the conservatives post-Trump, was seen as a new face that could try to unite the parties. Meanwhile, the NP NRP, the new Republican Party, a more populist and controversial group, chose political commentator Ben Shapiro as a candidate. Shapiro known for his conservative views and often inflammatory statements was a divisive choice for many within the party. Both parties are trying to unite the parties, while giving way on the choice of approaching issues. One can only see how a divide in the conservative base will result in an already hotly contested presidential race. Gus still runs deep. What the heck is this? K-S-A-F-S-A-Z. Stratocratic. Stasi remnants. Huh. That looks social media offensive. Is that Mr. House? Uh, after failure of the executive order, the attempt on the, of the Gabbard administration to stop James Haddock and other far-left political parties, Haddock started an online campaign to cement his popularity or the verdict. With the social media profile seeing a surge, Haddock and his social media team took their time and effort to attract as many people as possible to an ESP-friendly stance one critical of the liberal administration. Haddock, a lawyer and political theorist, was seen as a refreshing voice in the race with its criticism of neoliberalism and calls for government reform resonating with many younger voters. Haddock's platform was somewhat vague, but he managed to appeal to both left and right-wing voters with his message of unity and his promises to bring prosperity, law, and order to the country. His outsider status and unconventional campaign still made him a wild card in the race, and was many wondering if he would be able to turn his popularity into votes come election day. Social media is disabled, but we can make good use of it. When the heck did Galicia get here? Candidates. The presidential race was shaping up to be a crowded and contentious one. The Democrats are stuck with incumbent Tulsa Gabbard. A controversial president has been attacked and ridiculed due to a perceived departure from Bernie's plans. The ESP, a young party exposing law and order and populist ideals, chosen James Haddock, a lawyer and political outsider, as a candidate. Haddock is seen as a wild card in the race and his unorthodox campaign style and controversial views on issues like economy and national identity. Meanwhile, the new and old Republican Party, both still reeling from the split of the party, with nominating the old nominating uh, Ron DeSantis as a candidate, and the new Republican Party, running with the populism, chose political commentator Ben Shapiro as a candidate. As many candidates, all having strong bases, while the majority split party, a uh, major party split, will make this, this election unpredictable. A crap show to see. Well, that's what it always is. And I guess street action heats up. <laughs> Red has traditionally been a symbol of the left wing since the French Revolution. It originally used a symbol as the blood of the workers and the unity of all proletarians today. Red banners flood the streets, as leftist groups fight against the fascist Iron Corps. Maoist and anarchist groups have seemingly struck an alliance against both the Corps and the police. Riots pop up on a daily basis, protesting against perceived Iron Corps infiltration into police departments. One particular figure is approached that were appeared in several of these riots, a hulking gas mask clad man who the riders have deemed anarchy bro. Many of the riders have taken to wearing red baseball caps, inspired by the helmets of the Senrizuku struggle. In addition to its propaganda value, it also serves as identify anarchists and prevents them from being shot by their own side. Alternatively, the red cap has become a symbol for the left-wing movement all over America, and its side has begun to breed fear in the hearts of Iron Corps and police alike. Concerning. Yeah, that's really big. Past modernity. Kosovo, huh? 
The gray drizzle, the gray rain drizzled down, the asphalt slick and gutters filled. The street was cold, mournful, a crumbling factory in an empty lot, which a shanty town had formed. Rows of ill maintained brick te tenements with boarded up windows, a pawn shop with a glowing flat screen TV showing election coverage in the window. An old man passing by, lost deep in thought, it was coming from a party meeting, but not the party of any of the candidates now being splashed across the TV. The new Jeffersonians, where it had been a guest of honor, Todd May was still thinking about the ideas floated at that meeting. The state was a structure which one class uses to oppress another. A simple idea, but what the, what are the nation? For the nation, the state are not the same, in truth. The idea is that in a rational world, we would never be connected in the first place. Tal was an anarchist in some sense of the term, but that anarchy was not one of bomb-throwing in the state. As a structure of oppression must be separated from the nation, the organ of human culture and identity. A new nation without federal law, but, without, but the law of the people. Anarchy to some, true order, true order to others. Todd was old, perhaps too old to be a vanguard, but he was not alone. Dissatisfied libertarians, burned out from leftists, and even a few writers all joined in this new struggle. For the cause, a Jeffersonian democracy of equals, a true laboratory of democracy. This was a new band of philosopher presidents, or madmen in the shadows who knew not, suppose that only God could. Everything is possible, and nothing is certain, except death and taxes. Of all men, forests. Ted looked across boredom as a dull uh, cream color in the conference table, like the rest of the furniture in the rented office, was of subpar construction. In truth, given the faces he saw in front of him, much of the same could be said about the room as the collective whole. Ten minor leftists and green parties, unwilling to fall in line with Haddock or the Communists, now came together on a collective ticket for the first time in history. He leaned back in his chair and sighed, with a little care for the dignity of his newfound status as presidential candidate of the Green Coalition. He still remembered the bombs, the cabinet, the idealism he had once left felt, and believing that industry could be abolished through such means. He was never caught was never caught, but the thoughts lingered. What if he could publish his manifesto? What would have, have been caught? Would all of his actions have been for nothing? Deep in the thought, his real brow was relieved as good old friend John Zerzan. Now his vice presidential candidate began to make a speech. We are old men in a den of wolves, but the wolves have rotted their own teeth to the seat of the, ca the capital. I will not worry yourselves with their power or their weakness, or our weakness, nor for the prospects of the presidency in any serious capacity. We are all here to promote our message, and eventually the factories and the capital that burdens the people should be destroyed by those who had enslaved that they had enslaved to continue its eternal. Again, Ted looked across the boardroom, but that cream seemed almost the tiniest bit brighter. We see it on 50 by observation in the NYPD crackdown on guard activity. In response to the recent attack on comments by the guard, the New York Police Department has announced a crackdown on guard activity in the city. According to the NYPD officials, they have received multiple complaints from the public about the group's aggressive and intimidating behavior. The guard will involve increased surveillance and patrols in the area where the guard is known to operate, as well as strict law enforcement. Uh, enforcement of laws related to weapons possession and violence. The NYPD is still working with the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security to gather intelligence on the group and their activities. We should be careful around the police. Wow, oh my god, look at that. They're just straight, racing straight through Ukraine. The campaign trail. Tim had never been a political man. In 57 years of life, he never attended a political event. Never watched a debate and never voted. As far as he was concerned, it was all a game played by both rich screwers and designed to screw over the poor screwers. Every time some door knocker or canvasser pounded on his two-bedroom rental, he told them to F off, and that was that. But not today. Um, have you heard of this? Please go ahead. Um, as soon as he opened the door, he knew something was different. The canvasser was a young woman whose face was worn and whose eyes were ringed with shadow. She looked as if she had been knocking on the door for hours, but her eyes. Tim caught them once and could not dare look at them again, where they burned with an inner fire, the fire of a person who believed heart and soul in what she was selling. When he spoke, it was not the trite phrases and platitudes that Tim had heard countless times before. She told the nation in chaos, the people shocked and exploited him, of the coming catastrophes caused by decades of globalist greed and unfettered capitalism, and of the man who would save them, a man that the woman spoke of like a god, James Haddock. He, she received no pay for her work, spreading Haddock's message was enough pay for her. She told Tim of hearing Haddock speak of the energy of the crowd, how he talked to the very soul of a person, how he would save them all. He handed Tim a pamphlet and told him that Haddock would be holding a rally on Saturday. That should come, no pleas, no vote, no questions about issue, just a request to come to the rally. Tim watched a young woman walk to the next house and look at the pamphlet. It showed a stern-faced man on a stage, surrounded by a rapturous applause. The text prompted unity, purpose, order, and justice. Tim thought it over, and they made plans to see this haddock for himself before making headway daily. The ESP's party relocates. The Eagle Spirit Party is moving to Albany, uh, New York. According to the party officials, the move is necessary in order to ensure the safety and security of the members, as well as avoid any further legal troubles. The party has started building a new headquarters in Albany that represents their ideology and its structure, or its architecture. The new headquarters will feature a brutalist architecture. Inside, the headquarters is truly impressive, with large open spaces that are designed to inspire feelings of awe and intimidation. The main hall is dominated by a massive stone altar that serves as a centerpiece for the building, and the walls are adorned with murals depicting the party's vision for the future. I also have a large training facility, allowing them to hone their skills and improve their living habits. And necessary precaution. I like this guy. Uh, Gennady Zyuganov. Adam denounces anarchist savagery. America is a promise, you this. Have I not yet begun to fight? 
Haddock spoke in a booming voice, pacing back and forth across the stage as he did so. The crowd. A roar jumping out of their seats with a thunderous applause. Haddock raised his hand, silencing the crowd without a word. Furthermore, I promise you will take back the streets. With the help of a courageous police force and a steadfast guardsman, we are succeeding. Another pause of the crowd's roar, a few count from flashes. Big smile now, James. He thought to himself, waving to the crowd. Big smile. An excellent speech. President Gabbard announces an encore. Oh, your agents rise up. Look at that. The president sat down on the overstuffed chair, smiling soft at the reporter across from her. She was used to interviews. In fact, she almost liked them. They were calming, predictable, and more or less knew the questions they would ask her before, and usually had an answer ready before the interviewer had even asked a question. This time was no exception. Madam President, we've all seen the news lately, the clashes in the streets, the violence. What do you plan to do about that? Tulsi nodded slightly as the reporter talked about uh, before delivering her response. Before I address it, I want to address the worrying trend I've seen arise. She turned to the camera, her, heart, her face hardening slightly as she spoke. My fellow Americans, the Iron Corps is not your friends. They may speak about order and stability, but that's a lie. They are a violent paramilitary group bent on destruction of our democracy and the police forces across the nation. We we'll offer tacit support to them. I beg you to consider your support. I promise you things will get better. You do not need to work with such thugs, she said firmly before turning back to the reporter. Next question, please. Hey, Jupiter. Jupiter, where's, where's the reporter friend of yours? Dugan, huh? Haddock Dunas is Iron Corps. And what are the Iron Corps? Haddock spoke to the rapt crowd in front of him, and his face stony and serious. In reference to the so-called crusaders of law and order, he paused to shake his head. Speaking in the same way a disappointed father might speak to his child, they're nothing but thugs and criminals. They fight in the streets like common hooligans. I'm surprised they haven't shot anyone yet, frankly. He let out a size and said that, trying his best to play up the disappointment in his voice. My fellow Americans, I implore you to stay home. Let the police and the guardsmen deal with us. I wonder if Pr Price can take a hint. They get a piece out because they have two rebels. Here. Okay, interesting. Uncanny press science. Shocking news. Um, out of Baltimore today, as gunfire rocked the streets of downtown Core, sending locals running inside and police SWAT team scrambling. The bullets, uh, seemingly fired from a building across from the Clarence M. Mitchell Jr. Courthouse, hit several uh, uh, anarchist demonstrators who were protesting for the release of an imprisoned anarchist. Of an imprisoned anarchist. Uh, please have yet to make a statement, but we at W. Ball TV have 11 have an insider scoop. On the phone, we have Nathan Clark, a member of the so-called Iron Corps, who's claiming responsibility for the attack, saying you need to clear the streets of trash. Well, more after the messages. Well done, come on down. Is Russia going to explode more? Oh, yeah, they are. Oh, oh look at this Belarus. Collapse of the Russian Federation. Nice. The Russians simply shrug. Price is cutting plan. Look at this. Novosibirsk. And this guy. Lushenko. All political power is a result of deception more than anything else. Uh, the power of ideology uh, and belief can move mountains to make men ignore injuries beyond the point of death. Price had understood this fact for years, decades even. And even though the political landscape has shifted and changed, there's still nothing but falsehoods propping it up. A lie is a powerful thing, and the truth is nothing but a means towards the end. Truth can be dictated, the guard and the iron core, although the same thing from the perspective of truth. Can be split from each other in the manner one would split the mind between two tasks. United by the cloak of secrecy, but divided as a performance of the masses. The guard shall replace the Iron Corps' front in the service of the police, while the Iron Corps feigns radicalism as a means of distraction. The guard shall be the brave defenders of the law and order, while the Iron Corps will be the wild thugs in the streets. The narrative that is what binds this lie to the truth is far more convenient for to hold for many. The power of ideology is strong as it can move mountains. I shall bring a new dawn to the United States who battled through bullet. How does he keep coming up with these ingenious schemes? Oh, do we have more here? Cult of the Sky. Uh, King of Eyes. Okay. Enter Cosmos. This guy. Korolev, huh? Russian Republic. Russo Buryat Cooperative Republic clashed between the Iron Corps and Guard. Fresh unrest today in the city of New York as the apparent civil wars broken up between the rival factions of the Iron Corps military group. The new group calling themselves a government urgent administrative response detail or guard for short have proclaimed the Iron Corps to be a danger to public safety. The guards said on the shooting at the Clarence M. Mitchell Jr. Courthouse as an impetus for the actions have moved to put key members of the Iron Corps under civilian arrest. Odds and clashing with supporters to try to do so. No injuries so far have been reported as of yet. Thank you, but in this reporter's opinion. It's only a matter of time. This is Anita Amir for the WABC TV setting off a rousing performance. Oh, here's Karelia. The Knights of St. Gregory. She's kind of pretty. Russian National Unity Front. The Eurasian Recruitment Front. Volga Republic. Dagestan. Iron Corps card conflict intensifies. More clashes today, of course. Between the guard and the Iron Corps on the streets of New York City. Or at least New York, at the very least. Uh, production, here we go. 
The Guard faction appeared to have gained the upper hand in the Iron Core Civil War, of course. We had the large groups of the core Iron Core members being forced to disarm, often at gunpoint. Once disarmed, the Iron Core members are led off to an unknown location. The NYPD has been largely absent thus far, citing a lack of resources to crack down on the so far bloodless war. One thing is for sure, something major is happening behind the scenes. They still have Cossacks? Oh, look at that app. Price in the limelight. Hello, America. My name is Dallas Pride. Ooh, you do have Republic. The man sitting in front of the camera spoke coldly, his, his face a mask of steadfast determination. Uh, behind him stood two men in riot armor. Their bodies rigid as they stood at attention. I'm the commandant of the government's urgent administrative response detail. We may know us as a guard as we speak. The gallant members of the guard are completely conducting a special operation to purge the streets of the so called Iron Corps. He said, Iron Corps? That is a dirty word. His face showing a look of disgust behind him. One of the men shifted in the feet. This is a fifth take, and he's getting tired of staying at attention, but did not dare to complain. Dallas continued. The Iron Corps are a threat to the peace and stability of the nation, a threat to the Guard intensity with harshly. Dallas stared at the camera, did on, his face a mask of stone, and implored you civilians to stay inside, let the Guardsmen do the work soon. Support of James Haddock and the Eagle Spear Party will lead America to a new age of prosperity and stability. I Invictus. Welcome to the Eagle Spear Party, Commandant. Oh. I'll tie two of us back, huh? Saras Restoration Front. Okay. Kalashnikovites. Kalashnikovites, yeah. Mikhail Kalashnikov Jr. The Gunrunners. Stabilize in the country. Well, cut the fat. The Byzantine Republic. Uh, Northern Fleet Command. Well, that's one way to stop the war in uh, Ukraine. Pacific Fleet Oversight Zone. This is weird. Good job, Recrain, for not losing everything. I guess. Well, we've NATO and the Visigoth group a police shooting in Baltimore. Oh. A TV signal crackled in an outstring under the efforts of dozens of electronic uh, warfare specialists assaulting the signal. It slowly morphed into the form of a gray-haired black, gray-haired man. Blitzer with the night stop stories of the puppeting said paid parrot. Following the Baltimore police lazy and incompetent attempts at keeping order by shooting innocent black people. A tide of anarchism swept over the city. Lawless bands of anarchists rabble flood the streets as the police cower. Unconfirmed reports say the National Guard is being mobilized. We at CNN hope that the order will soon be restored. I had to switch the TV off. You'd see enough to know this was opportunity knocking. Chaos in the streets, incompetent police, scared and terrified citizens, proof that the neoliberal system was crashing down about around us all. He sat down at his desk, began composing a message to Price. This was a spark, this was a time. And for a few short hours, the guard and the Iron Corps would be battling the mob and showing who was really committed to law and order. All units prepare to march. Ritual purgation. Sticks and batons clash with shields. Violence echoes throughout the now deserted streets of Baltimore as the guard and the Iron Corps fight, and the city slowly sets itself ablaze in a cleansing fire. Although both the Guard and the Iron Corps claim to be fighting to protect the city from anarchists looting and thuggery, they mutually decided that the best means forward towards prevention of criminal activity is to loot and burn the city themselves, of course. We're aware that this is merely a front to increase chaos in the nation and sow further seeds in our favor. The National Guard, in an absolute desperation, they put a tourniquet on the violence pouring out of the city like an open wound has sanctioned off or sectioned off the grand melees to contain the violence and slowly separate the two sides. However, the Iron Corps and the Guard in a clever and obvious choice of uh, outfit and planning are almost identical in appearance. As soon as the National Guard believed that it contained the violence, more fights would start inside the previously peaceful isolated groups. Seeing this ever-increasing carnage and the threat of a genuine firefight, plainclothes officers of the Department of Homeland Security had begun to fall into National Guard lines and lead them away from the chaos that threatens engulf them whole. All these break off and the police desert the posts. That's always good to, ha to happen. That, that, that happened, right? By this point, the police had clearly shown themselves as useless and incompetent. As they huddled behind barricades and in besieged precincts, it fell to the brave warriors of the Guard to do their job for them, as expected. The whole incident started because a few of the racist, incompetent members proved that the whole department was real with rot. Laziness, stupidity, bigotry, and cowardice was all it took to get a job on the force these days, as expected. As police have always been the foot soldiers of the global capital, working for a meager paycheck and a chance to be people. Of course, it does not create a disciplined law enforcement agency, as it clearly being demonstrated on the streets of Baltimore. The National Guard, cops with bigger guns, have broken ranks and are chasing after civilians, no doubt wishing to join in the raping and looting being conducted on, by the anarchists. Seeing an opportunity to beat up the helpless, the, cor the cops have begun chasing the Nat Guards, leaving sections of the city completely unfettered, or undefended, except by us, where real law enforcement has failed will step up. As they run off, tails tucked between, behind their legs, will march to battle. As they flee the mess they created, we will find out and take back the city. Separate for now, we may need you to keep order. Detachment Charlie. 
As the cops and the National Guard fled, the brave soldiers of the GU Iron Corps noticed a distinct lack of the anarchist menace. A few opportunistic looters were quickly put down. As the scouts pushed deeper into the inner harbor, they discovered why. The police presence, uh, presence was surrounded by a mob who were bashing down the doors. The station seemed undefended. This would not stand. Soon, the march of a thousand feet thundered down East Fayette uh, Street. A devout, a line of devout Iron Corps soldiers marching in tandem. Although the anarchist rabble fired a few, fired a few pot shots, they were met with a volley of fire from our brave soldiers. Dozens of enemy soldiers fell from the roof lines, and yet more still crawled forth from the concrete hive. No matter. Soon, anaconda seals encircled the building, trapping the anarchists. So, despite the enemy's clear inferiority in training and ability, they have themselves a very defensible position. Our weapons uh, take pockmarks out of the concrete and pick off a few anarchists dumb enough to stick the heads up, but not much else. It wishes to successfully siege a building, but it requires strategy, fortunately. Unlike the anarchists, our leaders are cunning and will soon have a plan. Move up and assess the situation and taking fire. Crack, crack, crack. A burst of unfocused gunfire rained down the, from the rooftops. Our valley warriors quickly found cover and returned fire. Some of them made the ultimate sacrifice cut down by the vicious and cowardly anarchists. They quickly avenged as Iron Corps units returned fire. A particularly fat anarchist and an ill-fitting attack vessel cut down and fell from the roof of their satisfying splat. A round of laughter echoed from our side as the anarchists cowered. Still, despite their best uh, clear incompetence, the anarchists are still dangerous. They sit on a cache of police arms and equipment. If they were to break out those out, those arms would be in the hands of every bomb-throwing lunatic in Baltimore besides. We should have those arms, as it's only fitting that we, as a successor to the useless police departments, should receive the tools that they are too lazy to use. Our forces have dug in and are trading with fire with the anarchists. While they are untrained, they have a lot of bullets and guns, and so our soldiers have been killed by lucky shots. Digging out the anarchist tick is going to be a challenge. All units form up, avoid a uh, line of sight, and the siege begins. The anarchists think that their little fortress protect them. That cowering behind its walls will save them from the tsunami that stands wiped them away. True, while we have been largely regulated to trading fire, we have commanders that actually understood things like lo logistics and planning and not relying on random ch chance for your revolution. Within an hour surrounding the precinct building, our operatives have cut the power and water, for good measure. Some of our snipers shot up the AC unit on the roof. No AC, no water will take their toll as the siege continues through the hot summer day. Regrettably, the strategic victory has not been without losses on our side as well. The anarchists have the high ground, and though their individual marksmanship is poor, they can fling out a lot of bullets. Still, the situation is stabilized as our forces dug in, and we've made sure to avenge our fallen brothers and sisters by inflicting casualties of our own. Every hour, the terrorists grow weaker while we grow stronger. It's only a matter of time before they break. Hold them there for now, and oversight. A principle of tactics that has to be memorized and respected is that of knowledge. The ability to understand the situation is often worth hundreds of lives and provides a keen tactical advantage. That being said, technology wasn't always priced as strong suit, and when a bunch of his men came forward with the idea of using a drone for surveillance during a situation like this, well, he didn't know. But as he sailed above the siege, he was darn glad he had some kids that could teach him the wonders of this kind of crap. As he covered over his own lines, he saw a good chunk of good men holding together the strength of will and courage that he himself admired. On the other side of things, we could see the anarchists and the pathetic little thing that they dare call it a fort. A shot rang out from both sides, the drone was at a small amount of risk, but it was flying high enough that even a massive explosion couldn't touch it. Captain be advised, there's a fly on your helmet. The DHS gets involved. From a distance, a white unmarked van could be spotted making a break for the police station, but as it hit the guard lines, it stopped just for just a moment. As the people driving it leapt out, they were yelling about how they were going to assist the guard in their siege and how the U.S. government had a surprise in store for the anarchists who placed themselves on government property. The men were dressed in military uniforms with no markings, and thrust forth papers, IDing them as the National Guard. The short back and forth between the guard lines opened up and opened up the barricade, letting the whole white band through their lines and allowing it to continue its mission speeding towards the police station. As the guard had already long known, the government was desperate for any sort of ally, and had, a, had told them uh, to work with the police and government, for, at least for now. They simply provided more evidence and more ammo to the guard and their point of view, although they did not provide any more ammunition to the rifles, which is by this point had begun to dry, run drier and drier as the siege continued onwards with no end in sight. Let them through, Captain. Bravery, stupidity, or both. The volume of gunfire directed at that unmarked little van was truly astonishing, yet what was more astonishing was how they did not give up. Crack, boom, bang, all the sounds of explosion and righteous fire, yet there was no stopping this darn vehicle. The guard did admire the bravery it took to drive a suicide trip like that, especially since that trip would provide them the key to their victory in the slowly dragging out siege. As it approached even closer, Molotovs and pipe bombs hit the dead center, causing significant, significant damage to the van. Yet with only one tire and full bullets and blasted... Uh, blast-proof windows, the ma van managed to park itself directly next to the station, having left the last few dozen meters at about 10 miles an hour. That must pay those agents pretty, a pretty penny, and the agents return. The back of the van slammed open, and it came from a pour of machine guns fired at the anarchists on the roof and at the window of the building. The suppression managed to hold up, as a DHS agent ran for dear life towards the guard lines, vanishing within the masses of armored men towards the destination unknown. The anarchists already knew the drill, they had been hit with tear gas attacks before, and this was no different. The workshops had covered this, and many of them had already brought makeshift protection to serve this very purpose. In this moment, the hurts of both the anarchists and the guard were calm. There was no fear there was an expected moment of an arrive. And many of these figures had been riots, in riots before. Some were thinking of ideology, why well, they fought for their beliefs and all that hooey. Some were thinking of their families and how they would care for their children and their parents this way. Some were thinking of the future and how they wished for a better world for all. 
These men and women thought many things for the next few seconds, and these things you think when you know you shall live longer, but lo knowing is a difficult thing to truly hold, is it not? Captain, you have your men in a fixed gas mask. Captain, are you receiving the Baltimore Affair? Death, carnage, corpses. There were not many bodies left when the dust settled, only pieces. Many of the buildings in the circle around the police station lay in rubble, and on the ground there were brown spots where a person once stood. An anarchist, who a few moments ago earlier was on the top floor, wandered from the wreckage. He felt cold. He was shivering. And for some reason he couldn't feel a lot of his body, but he was alive. He survived and he was going to walk away. He had to go to his mom's birthday in a few days. What was he going to get her? She liked him in candles. He walked and then stumbled. The dusty night had as he wandered toward the guard lines. There he saw a figure limping out of the smoke. He was missing an arm. His mask had bitten into his face. His red-hot blood covered his entire uniform. Around him lay parts of people, arms, legs, heads, chunks of meat that had been burnt before they could reach the ground. The anarchists knew they had to fight this man, this fascist scum. This guard was the enemy, the oppressor, but his arms were not doing what they... He asked them, why were they not working? Why couldn't he raise his arms to strike? Why, why was he shivering? Why did he hate this man again? The guard man collapsed to his knees and next to him, just staring at the anarchist. The anarchist did the same, staring back at the enemy. He was very cold now, almost too cold to describe. The world spun, the lights around him flashed and dimmed, and all he could do was stare at this man across from him. He had pretty blue eyes, pretty blue eyes. Why were they enemies? Why did they fight? Why, why, why? Pretty eyes, blue like the sky. The anarchist and the guard sat across from each other, both missing their arms. The guts spilled over the dusty grounds and caked with d dirt and soot. They died, staring into each other's eyes, and the revelations they had learned from those last few seconds would die with them. What did that happen, Price? Laying blame. The greatest surveillance showed a white van. Two men in boiler suits traded it for two men in uni military uniforms. Price switched to his next video. More security footage, this time in the same van and the same two men arguing at a guard checkpoint. The next video joined footage of a white van parked in front of the police building and two men in military uniforms running out of the smoke surrounding it. Are you sure Price had a cautious? How do you know these guys are DHS? We got the bodies, Price responded. I watched it all go down with the drone as soon as I could get a squad of guard to dig through that bar and drag out the corpses. We have dental records. I deem them as Agent Ryan Johnson and Agent Larry Brown, DHS. James, this is a smoking gun. Haddock's eyes narrowed at the, at the, at the, at the thought. This would be the death blow to Gabbard if ever got out, and the truth is deserves to get out, Price, especially with something as big as this. Maybe, said Price, but it might be more constructive to keep this our little secret. Remember, the commons have been crow crowing about how Baltimore riots have all been a DHS plot. We don't want to give the campaign any ammo. Maybe we should have a chat with dear old Tulsi instead. Let's see what they have to say about it. Madam President, this is Commandant Dallas Price. I'm calling about DHS agents Ryan Johnson and Larry Brown. See, they had a little rental van up in Baltimore that they didn't pay for it before it blew up and they died. See, now they owe something and I'm going to make sure they pay what they owe. Uh, a few seconds of silence and then the response. Mr. Price, what the heck are you talking about? Oh, Nina hasn't told you? Well, let me spill it out, Madam President. We still have proof that the DHS was behind the bombing of Baltimore. We have security footage of eyewitnesses and we have bodies. More silence than a wavering hush voice. What do you want? Simple, Madam President, I want the federal government to stop the unjust persecution and surveillance of the guard. In turn, Agent Johnson and Brown's deaths will be forgiven. Price waited for the response, several agonizing minutes. He could hear Gabbard's shallow breathing on the other end of the line. Then the response came. He didn't come to an agreement. We don't negotiate with paramilitaries. The Department of Defense held a press conference today to provide new information about the recent attack in Baltimore. The department's representatives stated that their investigation has revealed the attack was orchestrated by a group of domestic anarchists who operate within the city. Some local civil rights organizations have spoken out, claiming that the department's investigation was flawed and that evidence was fabricated to fit a predetermined narrative. They claimed that the individuals named as suspects by the department were targeted because of their political beliefs, and that the department was trying to link the attack to a group, known group in order to justify a crackdown on domestic dissent. As the investigation continues, many are calling for an independent and transparent investigation to determine the true culprits behind the Baltimore attack and to ensure that justice is served, and thus a lie becomes the truth. The death of Ali Bongo, if you read about that, please go ahead. Since investigation. Well, in the wake of the recent Baltimore affair, when an attack occurred and the official story was that it was orchestrated by a domestic terror group, widespread suspicion about the truth of the events had called for a deeper investigation. In response, the Republican coalition controlled Senate has established a special committee to investigate the attack and to determine the true culprits behind it. The committee will be chaired by Senator Marco Rubio, a prominent Republican member from Florida, while the power to subpoena documents and call witnesses to testify under oath and announcing the formations of these committees. Senator Marco Rubio stated that the committee's goal is to uncover the truth about the attack, regardless of where the evidence may lead. This should shake up the polls. Oh my god. I'm still trying to cut the fat. Uh, stream on the high command. Bureaucratization has been plaguing decision making another top. making. decision making among their top officers for a while now. To fix this, uh, the high command will be streamlined. Riding in Seattle. 
scenes early reminiscent of 2017, are coming out of the city of Seattle, with instances of rioting and mass violence being commonplace. Capitol Hill, as well as many smaller neighborhoods in central uh, Seattle, have fallen into anarchy once again. Violence is not commonplace as city police and anarchist forces are engaging in multiple standouts and small, small skirmishes, with most localized around bridges that connect North Seattle to Seattle proper, as well as Capitol Hill's neighborhoods. Many services, such as power and water, have been cut in the area in order to prevent any uh, form of drawn conflict, as seen in 2017, but also made combating the many man made fires within the city impossible. Many critical of Seattle's actions, some calling it inhuman, whilst others call for National Guard to be mobilized and allow for the first responders to enter the city, central city. Typical. Cutting the fat. Logistics uh, issue. Currently, the logistics network for the U.S. Armed Forces is in utter disrepair. And having to deal with a she hampered transportation system doesn't help either. Efforts will be made to make sure everything that the troops need can arrive on a reasonable time. That reminds me a little bit of TNO, because there's a lot of reading. Wow. National totalitarianism is doing pretty okay. What sport is going down slowly? Interesting. Okay. Um, probably should do that. Probably, at least. Not like we can make anything, either. What happened here? You need a Brit... Oh, God. Anarchist Francis Lorraine O'Grady. Bruce Roberts. Oh, crap. Victory for the Right Coalition. Presidential Debates. Oh, God. Moderator, uh, good evening and welcome to the Presidential Debates. Uh, today we're here with our four candidates, Tulsi Gabbard for the Democratic Party, uh, James Haddock, who's the leader of the Eagle Spear Party, Ben Shapiro for the New Republicans, and Ron DeSantis uh, from the Old Republicans. Our first question is, how do you plan to address the issue of income inequality, income inequality in America? Madam President? Gabby, as or Gabbard, as president, I'll implement policies that empower the working class and give them a fair shot at success. This includes raising the minimum wage, providing universal health care, and investing in the education and job training sectors. These measures will help level the modern playing field and give everyone an equal chances to succeed. No good, Mr. Haddock. Thank you, moderator. The issues of income equality is one that I'm deeply passionate about. The fact is, the establishment has failed the American people. The rich get richer while the poor are struggle to make ends meet. That's how the system was designed, and no amount of internal reform will change it. It's time for real change, and that change should start with me, Mr. Shapiro. The issue of income inequality is a complex one, and it requires a multifaceted approach to solve. As leader of the New Republican Party, I believe in a combination of free market capitalism and personal responsibility. We need to create an economic environment that allows businesses to thrive and create jobs. This means lowering taxes and regulations on businesses so they can grow and expand. Create more opportunities for people to work and earn a living wage, which will help lift them out of poverty and incentives. The best way to do this is to assess economic growth, and you target assistance for those who need it most. We must make sure that the regulations protect the American people instead of being owners impediments to prosperity. We will bring uh, the opposite of what the Democrats have put on the table, the policies that still fail to this day. This is going to be a long night, guys. A long, god awfully long night. Presidential debates, too. What do you believe needs to change in, mis in America, Mr. Haddock? Well, everything. The entire system is rotten to the core. The establishment has sold us out to the highest bidder, and the rest of us are left to suffer. The Democratic and Republican candidates here on stage represent the same tired old ideals that have brought us to this point. They're both in bed with the elites and the special interests. Even the president is not immune to this corruption. But let me tell you, fellow Americans, this isn't just about talk, taking down the establishment and the elites. It's about rebuilding the country and making it great again. It's about restoring a nation to its former glory and reclaiming her place as leader in the world. Not looking good for Gabbard. A Gabbard goof. Night three. Oh, now we're on to our final question. What do you think people will get out of this debate and why do you think people will vote for you? Attic. I believe we're at a crossroads, and the choices we ha make today will determine the course of the nation for generations to come. I will represent everyone, and I pledge to work ceaselessly to lead us out of this nightmare for stagnation and failure. So I urge you, fellow Americans, to join me to this great endeavor. Together, we can reclaim our nation's greatness and build a brighter future for ourselves and our children. Thank you. All right, President Gabbard, same question to you. Well, I will work to create a more just and equitable society. I believe in a society where everyone has an equal chance to succeed, no matter the background. We must continue the work of Bernie Sanders and make sure this public lives to its full potential. Mr. Shapiro? I believe in the commitment to limited government, individual freedom, and American exceptionalism. I believe the best way to achieve a prosperous and free society is to allow individuals to pursue their own goals and dreams without interference from the state. We need to put America first in the economy, foreign policy, and what we teach your children. Dissentists, final remarks? I believe the most of country's heritage and way of life against forces of political correctness and radicalism that seeks to undermine our nation's greatness and foundations. Together, let us stand up for the values of America's country great and work to preserve them for future generations. All right, I want to thank you both uh, for a very robust hour and a half of fantastic debate. Thank you for joining us tonight for this historic presidential debate. That was interesting. Was it? Was it really? Allocates. You mean command power? Begin with drawing. 
Of course, this task will be much easier if it simply has less places for so set supplies to go to. The bases of Bra will be gradually closed down, and the troops within them shall return home. Social liberalism. 2024, huh? Cool. Well, the Baltimore affair. Turkey. Oh, they're having problems over there. Um, are they actually killing each other or what? The Komi Perm Republic. Federalism with the whiteboard. They're just not doing anything here, are they? I'm very surprised that they're not moving forward with this. Like, why would a Ukraine not take that back over? The Republic of Moldova. I guess Transnistria is so wrong, you can't even have it. Wow. Oh, this is a civilian population. Like, that's a lot of population. Uh, election night. The country's on edge as voters head to the polls. They said between incumbent Democrat Tulsi Gabbard and the three challengers James Haddock of the Eagle Spirit Party, Ben Shapiro of the New Republican Party, and drawn descendants of the old Republican Party. Both suggest Gabbard will win, but the election is yet to be called. She is relying on her promises of a climate change and healthcare reform to carry her victory. Meanwhile, Haddock has pushed past the Republican duo, making him a serious threat to the establishment. Can't wait to see how it ends. No winner declared. As the vote continues to be counted, it becomes clear that no candidate will win a majority in the Electoral College. This means that the decision will be thrown to the House of Representatives, where each state delegation will cast one vote for their preferred candidate. As the votes are tallied, tally, it becomes clear that Haddock of the Eagle Spirit Party has won the largest number of votes, but still falls short to the necessary majority. It sets off a frenzy of negotiations and horse trading against other candidates, and the supporters try to swing the vote in uh, their favor. Gabbard Shapiro both try to convince dissenters, and his supporters are throwing their support behind them, while Haddock uses his influence with his own party to try to swing the vote his way. As the drama plays out in Washington, the American people watch with a mix of uh, excitement and anxiety, wondering who will emerge as the country's next leader. Will the controversial Haddock, then come and Gabbard, the divisive Shapiro, or the old school dissentus? We will hold his breath as uh, the House of Representatives prepares to make his decision. It's not meant to happen. And Tulsi wins? Norfolk in flames. Oh boy. A moonlight night in Norfolk, a calm rain pittering and pattering on the rusty old roof built long ago. The TV turned, tuned in and out. The reception ever worsening as the electrical infrastructure had been slowly disintegrating over the last few years. A cigar was given a puff, a pull. A sweet smoke flowing through the stuffy air of the tiny apartment. Faded yellow walls, broken furniture, the American dream in shambles. The TV spoke to a lone figure bathed in his blue glow. Continued deadlock in Congress, no prison yet until he stood as an interim until a choice was made. The figure shot his eyes to his kitchen table, a bill was packed high, not a scrap of food to be found. Tomorrow he was going to sell his TV to Ford Ramp, but he wasn't sure if it would cover it all. Maybe he could just join that shanty town right outside of town. This wasn't right. Why the heck did he have to live this way? He'd worked every darn day of his life, and this was how he was going to spend his retirement in poverty? If he wasn't going to live much longer, he was going to at least use the time he had to enjoy himself. His landlord was going to die tonight, screw it, and he'll let loot, and he'll loot some other places on his way out. As he exited his apartment building, baseball bat in hand, he was met with a posse of black masked folks and a man, bloodied and weeping, looking to him for forgiveness. Yet he remembered those crocodile tears once before, and the company of these good strangers, his wish was fulfilled. Norfolk Burns, not out of a plan effort, but rather out of spontaneity. Might work for us? Railway guns. National Guard, you just arrived in Norfolk. The streets of Norfolk have been filled uh, with the sound of military vehicles as federalized National Guard units arrived to restore order the city. The arrival of the troops came at days. Uh, came after days of widespread rioting and looting, which began as a result of arising poverty and frustration among residents. The National Guard has been deployed to maintain a curfew and protect vital infrastructure, as well as to lo assist local law enforcement in restoring order. The governor of Virginia issued a statement urging residents to cooperate with the National Guard and to refrain from any further acts of violence or civil unrest. The National Guard is given a task of restoring, restoring order to the city and protecting citizens from further violence. They set roadblocks and checkpoints throughout the city and patrol on the streets in an effort to prevent further clashes. The situation in the city is intense. And the National Guard has been instructed to use force if necessary to maintain order. This is getting bigger. Despite the presence of federalized National Guard units, the situation in Norfolk has continued to deteriorate. Reports of spread of gunfire and clash between residents and the military have been coming in, and the city remains under curfew. Local businesses and homes have been vandalized and destroyed, and the death toll has risen. The governor has declared a state of emergency, and the president has promised to provide additional resources to help bring the situation under control. The violence has uh, escalated. And Tulsa Gabbard wins the house. President Tulsa Gabbard has nearly won re election through a vote in the House of Representatives. News has an outrage throughout the country. Fresh waves of rioting are being reported in most major cities. Gabbard's victory seems to be pyrrhic, as many are openly questioning the legitimacy of her authority. Calls for succession are circulating through the state capitals, and the communist parties are calling for a general strike. Negotiations for a vice president are currently underway, but have been met with a fresh wave of opposition and deadlock. It seems that this political crisis is not going to be solved anytime soon. The future of the U.S. hangs in the balance, and it seems that no one's quite sure what the outcome will be. The founders never thought it would get this far. A negative strategy. 
Norfolk burned. Even from the gas station on the edge of the city, Captain Ress of the Guard could still see the fires crawling through the city center. They tried to hold back the tide of red and black, but to no avail. The anarchists fought, fought like rabid dogs, hurling themselves upon guardists until they had been driven back. The pump clicked, and Ress withdrew the nozzle from the van's fuel tank. The owner of the station had been convinced to give up the fuel to the guard units, and the convoy of evacuees were herding into Hattacus territory. Vans full, start bugging out, uh, rest called, and the line of sta uh, station wagons, SUVs, and trucks began driving towards the highway. They offered protection to a group of civilians fleeing the wrath of the mob. It was press orders, a good PR move. As rest opened the door of the van, he noticed a pair of headlights headed toward the station. Eyes on, rest called, and a fringed line of rifles aimed towards the vehicle. As it approached, rest could tell it was a bus. A few makeshift Hattacus flags were strung up along the sides, partially covering the Department of Corrections markings. The bus slowed to a halt. And a man stepped out, arms in the air. He was dressed in a black body armor, the previous markings spray painted over, a gas mask covering his face. Identify yourself, screamed Russ. We're part of the Black Legion, brother, called the gas mask man. He spoke in a sing song, a drawl, which seemed too high pitched for his build. There's no such. Y'all going to Washington, are you not? Commander called. Y'all back to the group, didn't he? Russ paused. This man should not have been known that. They were either federal spies or he made the call. All right, get your ears in gear and come with us. The masked man chuckled and re entered the bus. As the vehicle passed Russ, Captain whispered to one of his officers, Watch him closely. Well, do, sir. And faceless brutality. A shocking video has emerged on social media showing the members of the National Guard being brutally attacked by a group of individuals wearing masks. The graphic footage, which has been widely shared online, shows the guardsmen being beaten and one being disemboweled. The identities of the attackers, who have been dubbed the lines by the media, are not unknown. The video sparked out widespread outrage and condemnation, with calls for the rep those responsible to be brought to justice. The governor has issued a statement condemning the violence and promising to investigate the incident. This faceless brutality of the situation is clearly being exposed in a state of emergency. The governor of Virginia has declared a state of emergency and ordered the National Guard and any other federal assets to enforce martial law within Norfolk and its environs. The measure, which includes a, a curfew and a ban on public assembly, is intended to restore order and protect citizens in the wake of widespread criminal uh, violence and civil unrest. Uh, the governor has also announced plans to establish a task force to investigate the recent acts of violence and to provide assistance to those effect affected by the crisis. The situation is spiraling out of control. How great. The Rhine's Roar. A new video uh, surfaced online featuring a self-proclaimed anarchist who has been dubbed the lion by the medium, delivering a fiery speech to the crowd of supporters. The video, which was recorded by another anarchist named Baker, shows the lion brandishing a fireman's axe while ranting about oppression of the people by the government and law enforcement. The lion speech is filled with violent and disturbing imagery, including the graphic destruction of a, or description of a National Guard soldier's disembowelment. The video ends with a lion holding up a soldier's severed head, declaring, I am become death, destroyer of worlds. The speech has caused a strong line, with some praising the lion as a revolutionary hero, which, and others condemning him as a dangerous extremist. It has been shared widely on social media and sparked a renowned sense of defiance among the city's anarchists who are rallying around the line in his message of violent resistance against the government. The fire rises. Slaughtering a Berkeley Bridge. A dramatic turn of events. Riders have taken control of the Berkeley Bridge and several streets down in downtown uh, Norfolk, using immobilized cars and trucks to block off the area. The riders, believed to be supporters of the ultra-anarchist man known as the Lion of Socialism, then set up on roofs and windows armed with ill-gotten guns and began attacking National Guard troops who were attempting to regain control of the area. The National Guard, who were caught off guard by the sudden and coordinated attack, were forced to retreat. The situation remains tense in the mid-Atlantic region of the U.S. is now on high alert. It's a fast-evolving situation. We'll bring you updates as they become available. The authorities have urged residents to stay calm and avoid the downtown area. This violent and deadly attack further escalates the ongoing crisis in Norfolk and highlights a growing threat of domestic terrorism to the United States. Chaos is in control. Lockdown in D.C. As the crisis in Norfolk continues to escalate, the nation's capital is taking action to protect itself from spreading violence. The D.C. Police Department and the Secret Service have locked down the entirety, uh, entire city center, closing off streets and increasing patrols in response to the National Guard's retreat from the Norfolk and rising reports of excellent violence in D.C. Lockdowns cause widespread disruption and inconvenience for the residents and tourists alike, but authorities insist that it is necessary to maintain public safety. The lockdowns also an, had an unexpected impact on the ongoing political crisis, as reports indicate that it has spooked a few of the last recalcitrant congressmen into voting for Tulsa Gabbard, who has been serving as interim president. With the election now in her favor, the Gabbard is set to become the next president of the United States, however. She is currently stuck in the Capitol, unable to leave due to the lockdown, things getting in order, and an election in extremists. As the crisis in Norfolk and D.C. continue to escalate, President Tulsi Gabbard, who was elected during the turmoil, has finally been able to leave the Capitol. The president who was hustled onto the Marine One by the Secret Service is now en route to an undisclosed location where she will hold a press conference to address the nation. Meanwhile, reports indicate that the head of the Department of Homeland Security, Jenna Witch, has a total loss on how to handle the situation. The National Guard's retreat from Norfolk and the lockdown in D.C. has caused quite widespread concern and confusion in the administrative head of the nation. The president's call for calm and the, for the public to trust in the government's ability to restore order has been met with mixed reactions. This is extremist ultimus. The line rises. Whatever control the federal government had left, seemingly shattered days, anarchist militants proclaimed the birth of a new revolution led by the famous Line of Socialism, and backed by so-called Army Committee, they've already taken steps to transform Norfolk into their image, one of anarchism. Time will tell what will come of this. You let the curiosity get the better of you and follow the line down the impossible rabbit hole. 
As to when you pick your perspective, it's probably not the best choice to play a faction whose perspective you don't follow. At least on your first or second playthrough. Who would even think of a follow such a deranged man? Oh, look at that. They're here. The Lion Rebellion. Look at this. The damage garrison is plus 100%. No gods, no masters. Well, the land. Balanced. Black Dawn. The guard have made their move. Across upstate New York, they march into the streets of the towns and cities. In most places, they have greeted with cheering crowds and waving flags. In many places, the place has joined them with a the guard, helping them secure order, as Haddock would say. He's been saying that a lot. Ever since the election, he's been sending out communications nearly on stop. Videos, articles, speeches, rallies, denouncing denouncing the deadlock in Washington that has brought, up to this, brought us to this crisis. Denouncing the corrupt bargain to place Tulsi back in office. Denouncing the savage dogs who butchered the innocent people of Norfolk. Denouncing the waste and corruption and greed and providing an answer, an answer that many people seem to like. Seeing local governments in New York have sent us dire warrants that Haddock's government has gained extensive traction. It's believed that the New York National Guard is in compromise. While Haddock has not declared an open rebellion yet, it's just a matter of time. The calm before the storm. And do not harm the oil and wine. Hey. Stefan smacked the man's hand with a mop handle. He fashioned to a bludgeon. The man jumped back, dropped the bag of rice he was trying to grab from Stefan's shopping cart. It had become quickly, become, uh, quickly become standard practice to carry a bludgeon to make shit body armor when trying to get whatever grocery still came in. As soon as the riot started, people had flocked to the supermarkets to stock up for the worst. Of course, because everyone was stocking up for the worst, supermarkets quickly became riots of panicking people, creating artificial scarcity. It soon became a rule of thumb. If the vegan and cricket mark meat replacers were still in touch, there's basic goods left. If even the meat replacers are gone, the place is empty. As mine, I call it, it's mine. The woman was screaming and clawing at a man's face as he ineffectually, ineffectually struck her with a 24 roll brick of charm and he held it in a uh, held it in a death grip. One of the bystanders looked at the brick in Stefan's car and Stefan's grip on the club titan. He navigated the crowd and turned to aisle 7 of the Walmart. As he spread through the mob, smacking off people trying to grab his canned goods, he noticed a growing commotion up ahead. The mob was solidifying like cholesterol in an artery. So an old woman was desperately yelling. People in the mob were reaching their arms through the human barricade, snatching away items, running off clutching jars of peanut butter and tomato sauce like they were babies. Stefan began to swing the cart around. The mob was reaching a fever pitch. A shot rang out. In the barricade, a flesh and cloth became an avalanche. Screams of fear as people's primal instincts took a hold and demanded they flee the scene. Screams of pain as people tripped and fell beneath the panic feet of the mob. The crash of people knocked into shelves, the crash of items falling, the human wave clobbered Stephen. Or Stefan. In a blind panic, the sh mass shoved his car over, clambering over, trying to escape. The car was pushed forward, its contents breaking open across the ground. Stefan was bowled over and fell beneath the granite boots. 37 dead at a local Walmart. Well, that's a normal day in Walmart, don't you know? Save emergency declared in Texas. Startling news today from Texas as the state legislature called an emergency session to begin the process of leaving the Union. Citing gross federal mismanagement, Governor Ted Cruz has demanded all federal troops withdraw from the future Republic of Texas and called up the Texas military forces to ensure compliance with this demand. News has been greeted with the public parades and rallies in Austin and outrage in Washington. With well, the current confusion over leadership, however, it's likely, unlikely that any action will be taken to prevent it. They'll be brought back soon enough. A red sunset. Red flags waving black boots marching. Slogans of solidarity and denunciation of the Washington regime. These sights and sounds become ubiquitous along the West Coast as workers walk out of their jobs and into the streets. What began as a series of rallies by multiple communist parties inspired into a general strike, denouncing the corrupt bargain in Washington, the manipulations of Haddock and the butchery of the Lion. They couldn't be the only political organization capable of leading the nation out of the crisis of capitalism. So far, Californians seem to be latching onto their message. The strikes have a widespread support, and the police response has been muted. Their allies have yet to turn violent, although the crowds are still arming themselves. Governor Newsom has attempted to uh, activate the California National Guard, but reports are coming in of two munis and sabotage. If something isn't done soon, the West Coast may fall out of federal control. Let them distract the feds. And what's next? Cold comforts. Charles set the axe down in the snow, listening to the air. Thump, 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 thump. At a distance out over the valley, a line of helicopters flew past, army ones with missiles and cannons. Charles took out a small notebook and wrote down a tally. Uh, 15th day. Today, he muttered under his breath, all oh, this 35 years living up in the mountains. He'd never seen this much activity as he bundled up his firewood and walked towards the cabin. He resolved to use some of his diesel for the generator that night. He needed to get on the ham to see what was up. Concerning. Even Quebec is concerning. Is this Quebec? Yeah, it's a language I can't speak. Montreal. Well, then what? Flash on the campus. Exception to the largely pro-war on terror media of the Cheney administration, with its biting satire hidden behind a veil of science fiction action, the prequel trilogy has been hailed as one of some of the best cinema produced during the war on terror. Uh, Pat Saffold Yan is Professor Yanovich of Media Studies 271 continued her lecture, her droning mix with the indistinct shouts from the protests on the quad. Most of the class was out there with only him and a handful of other students in attendance. Hey, hey, hey something's going on. One of the students near the windows raised her voice. The classroom rushed over. On the quad, they could see the mass of students and the line of riot gear clad police. 
Again, dangerously confrontational. The students approached the lines, and the cops waved shotguns and batons, and then it happened. One of the cops turned and shot at a girl with the F. Harris, the line rises, sign. Her head exploded into the meat, into meat, the quad fell dead silent. A scream rose up, and all hell broke loose. From the protesters, burning Molotov cocktails were hurled. Several cops fell down screaming, trying to get their kef- uh, coffins off. The others opened up fire on the crowd. Shocks rained out from the campus buildings down to the line of pigs. Get the F out of the way. One of his fellow students shoved Pat aside. He saw her attach a barrel to a receiver, inserted a magazine, and began firing on the cops. Around the classroom, several other students were pulling gun parts out of the, from their bags. So much for higher learning. Nothing like a good old brawl. Rust Belt and chaos, as the breakdown continues. With the failure of the federal government to contain the Norfolk uprising, a wave of protests and anger erupted across the nation. People were marching the streets demanding it just about everything. To put down the rebellion, to join the rebellion, to join the guard as to see from the federal government, but they all agreed on one thing the feds are corrupt and powerless and should not be listened to. The thing is, not just people in the streets anymore. Many said governments are furious, and some have even drafted emergency legislation to leave the Union. The Great Lakes region has become an epicenter of the populace upswell. It began with the lion inspired protests in several major cities. Several local politicians endorsed the protests, which expanded their intensity and influence. Soon, it wasn't just the cities protesting. As small towns, rural militias began to organize protests. Several corporate leaders have offered their support, and the state governments have told the National Guard to stand down. A general anti-establishment fever has gripped the land, which can't, be, which can't seem to agree on anything except F the feds. Nice. Begin with drawing. Pro-employment policy. Even after the worst of the 08 crash passed, many people are unable to find a job for themselves. Even with limited government funds, there's still opportunity to help the, expand the job sector. Another horse, a fiery red. We're coming over the center of the city now. Oh, gee, Christ, I hope it's not where they're headed. If they run through the protests in that tank, sweet Jesus, that's scary. For those of you tuning in, we are witnessing a police chase with a tank and a group of APCs. They turn down the street there. Oh, oh man, there's a, there are people out there in the, the street filming them. Folks, if you're watching this and you're in the theater, please do not get out. Please get out of the way, people. Now you can see that the, some of these vehicles have flags with fire axes and masks and whatnot. Being on the driver of the vehicles are mutinying. Army conscripts who are attempting to res, uh, support the uh, pro. Look there, they're headed towards the riots in the Capitol building. They're, we're swinging the chop around to get a. Oh, God, they're firing the Capitol building? They're firing the Capitol State, uh, state Capitol. They're screaming freedom. The delivery of trying to get the Second American Civil War is taking extremely long. Oh, they took more territory. Look at that. Secession Conference. Inside of the Georgia State Capitol, and that's why I propose to band together in the, in the faith of the oncoming collapse, the Senate proclaimed to the Congress. Hundreds of representatives from eight different states were attending the conference formed under the disastrous affair in Virginia. At first, many present believed the seating would lead to political suicide, but as the conference went on, and after the myriad of issues facing the United States being brought up, they understood that in order to save themselves, they needed to save the South from total chaos. See where the renewed democratic experiment will take you. So, we'll probably go this one. Even now, they claim to moderation like a drowning man to his friend's throat. The Marines bug out. The U.S. Marines have exfiltrated from Lord Fort Lejeune and could control over much of Appalachia, claiming loyalty to the federal government. They place the area under their control, under martial law, until the tide of radicalism has been defeated. While they offer now Lord of the Feds, there is rumor that some of their ability to control the territory is dependent upon a Christian Marines militia loyal to the clique of officers. Good, when you get the armed forces under control. The American Iron Front. All right, after 165 years, our prosperity. I was wrapped in a rebellion once more. This time spurred on by a group known as John Brown Brigade, an anarchist force led by Afghanistan veteran Pat Tillman. Long thought dead, his reappearance and claimed that the government attempted to kill him for a whistleblowing and sent shockwaves throughout the nation. The John people to his quest for vengeance on the Pentagon and freedom for all. Tillman's force consists of deserting military units and lionists inspired anarchists fleeing haddock. They claimed in their territory of the American Iron Front, expected they'll soon attempt to link up with Norfolk's uprising. More deranged anarchists killers on the loose. Great! And Fort Bragg defects to the Confederates. Look at that. Uh, Fort Bragg has announced their intention. To join forces with the Confederacy today, deciding to neglect and expect us to fight for them after all, all they've done? The announcement has sparked uh, waves of secessionist mutinies across the army, with many federal troops defecting to join the Confederacy. This move has been a major blow to the Union, given Bragg's borders and, and, and transport. Yeah, so Asheville. Uh, I was weird. It was weird to see Pat Tillman. I'm like, did he die in Afghanistan? Yeah. Harper's Ferry's up here. I, was, I thought Harper's Ferry was closer to, like, Missouri for some reason. Who's going to rebel next? The U.S. drops its NATO obligations. With a brewing civil war in the U.S. And following the recent deployment of regular troops to fight on American soil, the president has signaled to close allies that the U.S. will be unable to hold its end to the Washington Treaty, or at least in the near future. NATO is effectively dissolved until such time as the U.S. can get back on its feet and the U.S. federal government will return its military attention in and calling home its troops stationed around the globe. With those developments, uh, the alarming severity of the situation in America has been demonstrated to the whole world, and many will be going to bed uneasy tonight. I'm sure where the world stands now, and even more sure where it's headed. Add technology, nuclear bomb, add a negative a thousand nukes. Oh, second Republic of Cuba. Social conservatives. The Albany Rally. 
My fellow Americans, brothers and sisters, these past few years have shown us that the American dream is nothing more than a lie by the establishment. Seeking nothing more than divide and conquer you, Haddock took a pause to let the statement simmering in the crowd before continuing. Now the country's falling apart, and yet I promise you that the Eagle Spirit will live. It's our duty to stitch our, together, our nation back together. Applause bursts forth from the audience, accompanied by the waving of the Haddockist flags. Haddock smiled at his legions. As waves of men and women who would soon forge his grand vision, today the United States falls. Today, the Republican Union is born. Seven days banned in the order of the country. One more chance between the Blind Rebellion, the Confederation, and the, Republic, the Republican Union of America. Well, I guess we're going to have to go with this one then. Because the Republican Union of America is the one where I guess we're going to go to go down. I didn't, I didn't mean to choose this one, but okay. I kind of want to see what everything else was like, but I guess this is, this is who we're at. Um, get some arty. And, oh, that's rocket artillery. There, we want that one. Probably. I don't know. Support equipment. Um, I really don't know what we need here. Oh, uh, yep, then it goes Quebec. Locking down New England. Opportunity in Canada. To do. Militants of Canada requesting aid from us to spread the national totalitarian ideals of Canada. Move can't be contained by borders. Locking down New England. The Republican Union has secured its heartland in Albany. Yep, we are far from a sure position. Pockets of federal loyalists surround us with already staged attacks into our territory. We draw plans to seize control of these rump states through a mixture of busing and guard in our contacts in the local police departments. Now the only question is scale. Erasmus believes that we should strike Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New Hampshire. Simultaneously, securing as much breathing room as possible, Jupiter believes this will overextend our forces. Propose that we may take Massachusetts and New Hampshire first to encircle Connecticut and make resistance less appealing. Unless more aggressive attack will draw the attention of the feds more quickly. Let's get Jupiter's plan. Draw on the feds. Go with that one. Surround and Bastion, huh? Father calls us to war. Great people of America, how long have you been suffering under the failures of your leaders? How long have you starved under the insatiable greed of capitalism? How long have you suffocated under the oppressive yoke of blind materialism? And how long have you stood silent? I see before my eyes of a once proud people, now broken under the impossible weight of cold betrayal. We've been forced to watch forever corruption destroy everything they've accomplished. The public that we once knew has died and let lives rotting beneath our feet. It was killed by the same people, who refused me the opportunity to save it, the aristocratic elite in Congress and the fat pools in Wall Street. It was the rich, strong, and disconnected who bled our nation dry, harvesting our labor for their own gain, and when we were suffering and dying, they stood by and watched. And who has risen up to stop these tyrants? Bolsheviks? Fascists? Theocrats and anarchists? What hope do they have to top of the old world? You've seen the messages online and on TV. They speak of class redistribution, of race extermination, the will of God, and what other garbage flows from their mouths. But they speak lies. In your hearts, you all know well as I do. That simple truth. They are destined to fail. They speak of revolution, but they only know nothing of the sacrifice to achieve it. They speak of solutions, but only offer a pseudoscientific lies. Or pseudo-scientific. Pseudo they think willpower alone can win them a war. They think their precious ideologies will lead them to a glorious victory. They want to topple the old order, but they still obey its rules. But we know the truth. They can be no gain without loss, no progress without bloodshed, no victory without cruelty, no revolution without suffering. I see the eyes of a broken people, but I do not see the eyes of the people who have surrendered. And we will not surrender. You are the sons and daughters of a new age. You are the liberators of America. The once proud, more proud masses marching in unison to claim your retribution. You are the bearers of an eagle standard of a new world. Our victory is inevitable. Go forth, children of the public, claim your destiny. Our leader has spoken. The people march for war and victory. Ave Invictus. Huh. Well, that was James Haddock. Interesting. So we have mass military disorganization. Oh, Jesus Christ. We have veteran service. We've got political contestation. Jesus Christ. And a revolutionized economy. Oh, also, since we're here. Oh. Oh, we have our Marines and. Oh, my God. People rally to war. Oh, look at that. They took over part of West Virginia. Um, the drums of war and revolution are sounding around the Republic, shaking the blanket of idle passivity off the people. And as the drums sound, the thunder of a marching army follows, our citizens. Uh, the brave sons and daughters of the Republic are taking up arms in the name of the Republic. Uh, with a salute and ave invictus, they're setting, settling into the army's rank and file. Although many of them only had lives of passivity and submissiveness before the outbreak of the revolution, the call of the fathers inspired them to finally take a stand against the corruption and decadence that surrounds them, to rise as wolves in a land of sheep. Guided by the firm hand of the Republic, in our times as sons and daughters, we will... We will find new purpose and meaning in their lives. They'll learn discipline and they'll learn loyalty and they'll learn sacrifice, but above all, they'll learn a love for the Republic to defend its citadel and destroy its enemies. All they my children. Oh, we have six divisions. Look at that. Oh, what the heck is this? New York City Police Department, huh? Six police officers, huh? 42 soft attack. These guys are 18 combo with. Um, 
42. Well, okay. Oh my god, these look, these guys look really cool. Uh, okay, well, politically indoctrinated, butcher, guard captain. Patrols have been sweeping regularly throughout this neighborhood daily for at least two weeks now. The local CO had said that there would be some suspicious activity near the edge of the forest here, but every sweep had always come up empty. The two soldiers marched evenly side by side, their fingers already on the trigger to blast apart some divisionists that got in their way. Truth be told, they really weren't right taking all things seriously. Almost two weeks of nothing but boring walks, why should they be any different? One of the two men lost his footing, tripping over an explosive root as he left his mind wander, falling into what looked like a hole some kid dug years ago. Railing for just a moment, the man disappeared in a plume of dust and crash. As the dust settled, he came to face face with something that horrified him more than combat ever could. You okay, their brother? His comrade shouted, looking over into the dimly lit hole. His comrade squinted at his eyes, trying to make it out of the black colored armor in the earthy pit. Darn you, you felt like a baby out of a whore's vagina. You're not going to believe what I'm seeing, the fallen one grunted as he stood up, carefully making sure not to cut his fingers as he picked up a large blade. Some old machete that was made for yard work and headed up to the light. You seen this? he asked, gesturing down towards the pit. There's an entire stash of pistols and knives down here. Still, on the other, a man could only muster out a simple, if foolish question. I ain't supposed to be there, right? Defectors from the armed forces. The American military was once the strongest in the world, but the patrol of its leaders left a shameful shadow of its former self. Hearing our calls for revolution, thousands of servicemen have abandoned this flag of the old order and now pledge allegiance to our republic. They are battle-hardened well armed, ready to claim vengeance against the rats who stabbed them in the back. No dishonor in place picking the righteous side. Dossier conflicts. Oh, look at this. Interesting. Well, welcome aboard, I guess. I'll have you guys go up this way first, maybe. Black Legion begins their march south. Today marks first ever mop up campaign against the falling remnants of the United States. The Black Legion has been mustered, and these fanatical servants of a republic shall deliver the death blow to the Gabbard administration. Our plans march down the Atlantic Seaboard, seize the control of New Jersey, Delaware, and DC. As our enemies are disorganized, we'll expect little resistance. March my legions and haddock pushes. So our guard first taking full control of Maine. Thanks to assistance from local police, resistance has been muted. However, the northernmost reaches have been disorganized, seen disorganized insurgent activity, mostly local civilian militias and rogue army personnel. While harmless for many, or now at least, they may coalesce into an actual resistance given the right leader. Nothing we can't handle. The shadow falls. Ave Invictus, Ave Invictus. The interior of the Amtrak car echoed with the cries of frenzy fervor. Fervus closed the door to car number three behind him. The passengers of the cab parted like the Red Sea, and Fervus strode down the aisle. The divine words flowed unobstructed from behind the gas mask, for the truth of him could not be quenched. It flowed past the filter into the megaphone, so the entire cab could hear the new gospel of the new republic. Sword to the republic, today we cast down the tottering remnants of the div divisionary regime. Uh, today we secure our future from those who wish to steal it back from us. The words flowed automatically from Fervus's subconscious, for his soul preaching the word of Haddock to the cries, Ave, Ave. His conscious mind was looking over his men, inspecting them, and admiring his preparations for the purification. He passed a group of sons of Rome with red and gold capes and Latin slogans. He knew that some attached red crests of horse hair to their helms. He also knew that they carried civilian weapons, shotguns, long rifles, baseball bats, as planned. Each group did not bring their own weapons were assigned ones, and the weapons they were assigned were based on the loyalty, devotion, and competence. The sons of Rome were stupid, but they were loyally stupid. They had their arsenals boasted with a few spare handguns, and their ammo wasn't seated with deliberate squib rounds. They were in the father's hands. Unlike the group next to them, a few squads of convicts armed with baseball bats and bolt-action rifles. They were guarded by a group of patched clad militiamen who carried shotguns. The leader of this group was an early member of the Iron Corps dis distanced himself before Baltimore only to come crawling back. Traitor. He stood there lording over the prisoners, silently gloating that he would go into battle with an assault rifle and body armor, well, defective assault rifle and camo painted occupy pads. Ferris allowed himself to be briefly amused by the thought of a bullet ripping through the cheap fiberglass and into the militia leader's lungs. The mounted machine guns on the roof of the train let off a burst of fire. The hour of judgment was at hand. Every muscle in Fervis's body burned with anticipation. Our train is passing into federal territory. My brothers, this is our crucible. Each of your squads has been assigned an objective in a list. Your objective is which part of our operating zone you are to secure for the father. Now, the list tells you which divisionists lurk in that zone. You know what to do with it, uh, divisionists. Uh, do with them. Enraged cries rose up through the car, punctured by straight bullets striking the ar train's armor, and the rattling response of gun turrets. The train was slowing as it's approaching the suburbs of Newark. As a break screech, the legion cluttered around the doors and firing ports. First walked to the front of the car, my legion. Today we take New Jersey. The doors opened and the black tide swept out. Shadows over the mid-Atlantic. 
The explosion rattled the entire neighborhood. Dave peeked out from his basement window. He could see the flames and smoke rising from. An empty patch of woods next to the subdivision and the cell tower swaying and crumbling. Gunshots echoed through the dusk in the house across the street. Two loud gunshots and a woman screamed. The door burst open and the man ran out, clad only in a bathrobe. Bounding after him was a little militiaman dressed as a Roman soldier waving a baseball bat. The bathrobe man tried to clear the flower bed only to stumble and trip over a lawn gnome. As he fell to the ground, he put his hands up, pleading. The soldier twisted, readying the bat like he was at the World Series. Even from here, Dave could hear the cry, Ave Invictus, Mother Effort. Crunch. The bathrobe man lay dead on the lawn, his skull caved in like an eggshell. The militia man stood over the corpse. The baseball bat cracked in, crackled, cracked in two from the force of his swing. Dave ducked back down, cowering under the table. From above, he heard the muffled crack of the front door being broken down. They came out of the Republican Union on trains, trucks, and school buses, a tide of irregular forces and convict legions. They swam over town to seize the line, bringing devastation in their wake across the Mid-Atlantic. They marched to the Black Legion. Let us know about the group's inner workings or leadership. They are regular, seemingly consistently, uh, consistent of hastily assembled militias and convicts. The convict record is downright schizophrenic. One minute, a group of poorly armed penal legions ascended to the meat grinder. The next minute, another group of uh, conducts a complex battlefield maneuvers, wiping out enemies with minimal losses. Officially, Haddock and the Republican Union have made no comment and don't even seem to acknowledge the group's existence, however. For its indicate that the Legion has declared allegiance to the RUA and is working to secure the region for Haddock. A prelude? A Legion of Shadows. There's something unusual is happening. Ever since the Albany rally, our guard forces have moved to secure their territory. Our territory, in many places, however, they have arrived late to the party. Across the Northeast, a group calling itself the Black Legion is mobilizing. A civilian militia that's sworn loyalty to Haddock, their numbers are motley ragtag. Sons of Rome, conspirac conspiracy theorists, non-guard militias, and hastily organized penal legions have all made a home for themselves within the legion's ranks. While Price, understandably, is furious at the band of god darn Romabu jailbird cranks for their undisciplined methods of seizing territory for the Republic, they also claim to be loyal to our cause. Our intelligence assets are hard to work, gathering all available information we have on the group and its leaders. We'll find out how loyal they really are. How to take New Jersey. The Black Legion marched in the gate Garden State with the rifles loaded and bayonets ready. They swarmed through the cities, cutting down the scattered resistance poised by... Uh, partisans and gangbangers, artillery fire rained down on the cities and suburbs burned in mass infernos, and the Legion's wake was left to a wasteland of rubble and ruins and burned out ghettos and mass graves. Fortunately, this was only slightly worse than what New Jersey was like before. Well, the Garden State on lockdown, and next stop is Delaware Valley. Excellent work, my friends. And YPD acquiesces to Republican forces. Ever since the Albany rally, the ESP has been in negotiations with the city of New York City. Uh, the city of New York City, the city of New York. The Republican National Army and Associated Paramilitary Forces are not ready for an urban invasion of the ma magnitude required to take New York City, so they have been forced to use their contacts in the NYPD to try and draw the city into their sphere of influence. Today, these efforts have borne fruit. The NYPD has declared that it will acquiesce to the Republican forces. While many denizens of the city feel betrayed, more than intelligent residents I realize that working with their new masters would be much better long-term prospect than resistance. Good. The meeting. Now, Haddock himself wanted to meet the man. Fervus was dragged into Haddock's office, bound in a straitjacket. The two guard guardians flanked him, gripping the restraints that held the prefect. Unchain him, Haddock said Price, who was sit still beside him. Should it, sir, is that really unchain him? He repeated. The guardians, it is instructed, the heavy irons falling to the floor, the straight jacket was removed, Fervor stayed still as a statue. Haddock's calculating gaze locked with the man's shark like eyes. Then Haddock spoke, a prefect of Fervus, prisoner 48501-054. His scourge stands over ever at attention. Haddock blinked. The man's voice was like rumbling boulders. His accent was bizarre and impossible to place. It seemed like to switch every few sentences. Well, I'm grateful for your loyalty. You surrendered rather easily, rather surprising for a man with your blemished record. Haddock noted to the thick uh, manila envelope. Blemish was a nice way of putting it, he thought. A more accurate way would be getting gut-wrenching. You must also know the skills I possess then. Yes, we, we are aware of your service record. That's why I wish to speak to you. Right now, our army is disorganized, chaotic, with respect to the commandant. The guard is too thinly stretched, securing the heartland. We are also surrounded by weakly protected federal land, crawling with the divisionist vermin. We require more irregular forces to secure the Republic's chaotic hinterland. The Black Legion will be that force. As of now, it's not... It consists of toady militias, would-be Romans, with penal legions. It requires a leader or a strong leader. Haddock showed off. Fervus nodded. His shark eyes still locked with Haddock. And they believe that I am that leader. I am honored that you have, still have seen to fit my to unleash my talents. The legion is currently crawling with division, as, as you fear, and I shall be your scalpel, exercising every last bit of division's cancer from your sword. My plan for the legion is simple. Purification through combat. Although most of the enemy the legion shall face on the march for the Union will be disorganized militia, the Black Legion lacks combat experience and equipment. The Divisionist Legion shall be sent into the meat grinders, herded in by your sword. Your will determines which shall survive, hardened by the fire of combat into the forest to crush all division. Fervus paused, waiting for Haddock's response. Haddock slowly nodded. Fervus continued, My father, I shall march the Legion south, driving the fed rats out of your republic. The Legion shall be purified through bloodshed and nourished by empty prisons and subsumed militias. Our march for the, our Union is ordained by your will. It is inevitable. Haddock slowly smiled. Prefect Fervus, you know what to do. Ave Invictus. Uh, Fervus saluted. Ave Invictus, father. And with that, uh, Prefect 
Thervis was walking, walking out of the room, off to prepare the Black Legions for his bloody march. After the door closed, Pr Price turned to Haddock. So you've read that, that man's criminal history. You know what he can do. Of course, tell us, replied Haddock, as he was discussing the proper way to butter toast. That's why I put him in command. But I think I have to end this episode here, because it's just gone on way too long. But if you enjoyed the first episode of us trying to play as an extremist ultimus, please consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow when everything goes kaboom, and we actually go to war. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.